Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Steph Angelo. I'm the editor in chief of the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law Journal of Healthcare Law and Policy. The Journal of Healthcare Law and Policy is one of the law school's five student run journals. We publish two issues each year focusing on the intersection of health, policy, and the law. Today, we are thrilled to be partnered with the University of Maryland School of Social Work as we welcome you to our spring symposium, um, Uneasy Alignments The Mental Health Turn in the American Legal System. A few quick housekeepings. Um, I hope all of you have an agenda in front of you. We have four panels today. Um, we will be breaking for lunch in the afternoon um, and then transitioning to the School of Social Work later in the afternoon. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any of the other journal staff um, who will be floating around throughout the day. Um, we have a wonderful day uh, ahead of us and some fantastic speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dean Danchin to the stage to get things started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And good morning, everybody. Uh, and welcome to our beautiful Westminster Hall here at the Law School. Uh, my name is Peter Danch, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty. Um, I also direct our international law program here at the school, and I'm the faculty advisor to our international law journal, so it's wonderful to be here uh, for this event today. It's really a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the law school uh, for this uh, Journal of Healthcare Law and Policy Spring Symposium, which is really one of the, one of the highlights of our academic annual academic calendar. This sympo symposium is unique. Uh, it gets to the heart of the University of Maryland Baltimore's mission to improve the human condition and serve the public good, both here in Maryland and broadly uh, in society. This mission is greatly advanced uh, through interdisciplinary education. Uh, and as Stephanie mentioned, we're really thrilled that this year's symposium is being held in collaboration with the School of Social Work, uh, Daniel Thirst Social Justice Lecture Series. This provides us with the opportunity to explore and engage in today's topic from very different perspectives, and of course in the hope of learning and exploring new frontiers uh, in our respective fields. The journal itself, the Maryland Journal of, of Healthcare Law, was founded in 1997. It's one of our uh, older journals at the school. It serves as a forum, as I said, for interdisciplinary discussion of leading issues in health law, medicine, and health policy. The journal's contributors over these years have included physicians, legal scholars, health law practitioners, leaders in health policy, and experts in fields as, as wide ranging as philosophy, public health, uh, sociology, and other disciplines uh, with an interest in issues related to healthcare. Today's symposium, uh, as you all know, will feature critical conversations about the intersection of law and mental health across juvenile, uh, juvenile justice, child welfare, intimate partner violence, criminal legal systems, and public health and welfare. Uh, it's a very rich program, uh, and today's presenters and facilitators include many of the faculty here at the law school and at the School of Social Work, as well as from partner institutions, fellow University of Maryland institutions, uh, Morgan State University, and University of Maryland Baltimore County. Uh, so to all the participants who've come from far and wide, we're truly grateful that you're joining us here today, taking time uh, from your schedules to be with us. Uh, and to all the students and, and many, many staff members who've uh, contributed to this event, thank you as well. Uh, finally, I would just like to note that putting together a program and a symposium like this is not possible without the work of, uh, of really many people and particularly the outstanding student members and editors of the journal as well as the various uh, staff members, outstanding staff members here at the law school who've worked very, very hard to put this together. I'd especially like to thank and congratulate Hope Randolph, who's the uh, symposium chair for volume 26 of the journal. <clears throat> and of course, the editor in chief, Stephanie Vangelo as well for her outstanding work. Uh, lastly, I'd also like to, to thank the two faculty advisors to the journal, uh, Professors Kathy Hoke and Carrie Lowry, for their work with the students. Uh, yeah, thank you. 
So without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Corey uh, Shermeyer, uh, who will share a few words on behalf of the School of Social Work. Uh, so thank you all again for joining us. Corey. Thank you, Dean Danchin, and um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be here with you and to see all of you here. Um, so as Dean Danchin mentioned, any program um, such as this uh, takes the work of a lot of people. And I hope I'm not going to leave anybody out, but I want to mention them by name. So um, some of the people that you don't see here working behind the scenes, Dontrell Don Thomas, Shante Hatcher, out there. Hi, Shante. Isabel Garcia, Anita Bryant, who is here too. Where are you, Anita? Um, and uh, at our school, who you're going to see later this afternoon, Justin Hanna, Tom Mitchell. We have uh, Matt D'Agostino, Dag, taking pictures for us, and Dean uh, Judy Postmas, who is, <clears throat> excuse me, going to uh, introduce our evening event. Um, from the School of Law, we receive uh, support from Wendy Geist, um, Andreas Ortmeier, Jessica Williams, Wanda Haskell, um, and Arthur Cook, and Mr. George, who I just met, who's helping us here in this space as well. So thank you very much. We could not do it without the support that we have. <laughs> So again, I want to welcome everyone to a symposium that actually has its roots in a prior symposium in maybe 2010 or thereabouts. Richard Bolt and I met in a symposium on problem-solving courts that was held, held by the University of Maryland Journal of Race, Gender, Religion, and Class. I might, ha might have that out of order. Um, and that was under the stewardship of one of our dual degree MSWJD alumna, Ingrid Lofgren. So Richard was casting a critical eye on mental health courts, and I was similarly reflecting on the court-affiliated prostitution diversion programs that had recently emerged in Baltimore. Our recognition, seeing in each other kindred spirits, educators and scholars in professional schools whose graduates sought to apply their craft, often in ways that promised to ameliorate, ameliorate harm and suffering, being invited to combine their knowledge bases and bases and skills in ways that would improve both profession, pro professionals in both groups. And that led to a number of shared uh, projects. Um, we, for about half a decade, taught classes to MSW and JD students. We testified uh, once together and you know, have been thinking a lot about you know, what that means. So at the time, and this is again over 10 years ago, many in both social work and law were eager to embrace these programs which combined rehabilitation and social control, combined leverage with help and compassion with guidance. But we found that both in theory and in practice, a less rosy picture that included fraught professional practice where people were asked sometimes to compromise professional ethics and loyalties, often for individualized, if not unimportant, gains. Not only did these, ex these collaborations exponentially amplify, the exponential amplifications of power reach deeper into people's lives and psyches, but we feared that they also obscured the need for broader societal changes. These are precisely the kinds of worries, good worries, that we have come together to think about today. We are excited to start a dialogue across a wide array of substantive areas where mental health and legal systems combine, and which purposely brings together many people who are wa working in or near Baltimore from UMB Schools of Law and Social Work, as well as participants from our sister UM system institutions, Morgan State University and University of Maryland, Baltimore County so that we can help each other think about our respective and shared roles in relation to these kinds of policies and programs. Daniel Thurs was the dean of the School of Social Work from 1966 to 1976 and had a long career working at all levels of social work practice, including in the arenas of aging policy at the national level, community-based social work, and organizational leadership. He was known for an abiding commitment to social justice as both a guiding principle and as a call to action in his personal and public life, and for the kind of reflective practices that these demand and which we will engage in today. 
I am honored to join with the Journal of Healthcare Law and Policy to host our esteemed panelists in such a fitting conversation for our spring Daniel Thurs Social Justice Lecture. And I now will turn over uh, the mic to my colleague and friend, Richard Bolt, who will facilitate our first panel. Thank you for joining us. I want to invite the uh, first uh, group of panelists to come on up uh, as well. And while they do, let me just add my uh, note of thanks um, uh, to the uh, program organizers, Hope uh, and Matt and Stephanie. Um, all of the uh, folks that uh, help make the logistics work, and especially uh, uh, to Corey, who's really the, the engine that moved this all forward um, um, in extraordinary ways. Um, our work together um, uh, does go back at least 12 years, I think maybe more, um, and, uh, and this is a, a, a wonderful sort of culmination of those collaborations. Um, the symposium grows out of work that uh, Corey and I have been doing uh, individually in collaboration with each other and in our collaborations with others, including some folks who are uh, here today, um, uh, for many years now. Uh, and in my mind, uh, there are sort of two themes that run throughout this work. Uh, one centers on uh, both the promise of and um, the difficulties in uh, accomplishing effective collaboration uh, between those uh, trained in law and others uh, uh, who work in social work or other uh, helping professions, but particularly in social work. Um, the other theme involves uh, our deep intellectual uh, and practical ambivalence uh, toward uh, neoliberal reform practices within the criminal legal system, uh, within other legal processes and other human services practices. Um, as our panelists will explain uh, this morning, that ambivalence is inherent, I think, in the moment in which we find ourselves as practitioners, as academics, uh, concerned with our clients, their communities, and with broad objectives of social justice. Uh, the first panel invites our speakers uh, to share with us foundational concepts that led to, sustain, and challenge the integration of mental health considerations and interventions within potentially coercive legal systems. Our speakers this morning uh, will be Professor uh, Chrysanthi Leon of the University of Delaware, Professor Michael Sinclair of Morgan State University, and Dr. Inbar Cohen from Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, bios. Um, uh, professor Leon is Associate Professor of Sociology and Criminal Studies, Women and Gender Studies, and Legal Studies, and a founding member of the Center for the Study and Prevention of Gender-Based Violence at the University of Delaware. Uh, she is an interdisciplinary scholar in penology, law, and society, uh, and her research and teaching address sex, crime, and punishment, sex work, and the prison system. And as we'll hear in a few minutes, uh, uh, she teaches in a local women's prison. Uh, professor Sinclair is associate professor at Morgan State University and the chair of the Urban Children, Youth, and Family Specialization in the Graduate School of Social Work. Uh, he's worked extensively with returning citizens um, and violent offenders in New York, New Jersey, Virginia, and Maryland, and has co-authored peer review articles on community violence and engaging urban adolescents uh, in clinical treatment. He's a nationally recognized expert on urban youth populations and fragile families. And Imbar Cohen is the executive director of the Child and Youth uh, rights program of the Minerva Center on Human Rights at the law faculty of the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a mouthful. 
Uh, her research focuses on the interchange between criminal law and mental health law, examining the mutual effects of the two discourses have on each other, particularly in sexual assault and in prostitution criminal proceedings. Her main scholarship concerns are therapeutic jurisprudence and critical discourse analysis, um, and she draws from 20 years of social work practice in the Israeli sexual assault crisis centers. Before uh, turning the podium over to our panelists, I want to offer uh, some brief observations uh, about the nature of social problems for purposes of framing our discussion. I could just moderate this first panel, but I couldn't help but offer some substantive comments um, uh, given the nature of the meeting today. So I hope you'll bear with me for just a few minutes. Um, then each of our speakers will have 15 to 20 minutes to present, and the session will conclude with panelists responding to questions uh, from the audience. As we'll see throughout the day today, um, mental health or behavioral health interventions offered uh, or located or supported uh, by various legal processes generally are understood as targeting some problem. Indeed, problem-solving courts, like drug courts, mental health courts, prostitution courts, and the like, are expressed in this respect. But picking up the story at, the point, uh, at that point obscures important information about how social problems are conceptualized in the first place. Often, a problem, perhaps even a problem, understood to be so transgressive that it requires a coercive response has its origins in social and practical facts that are vague and amorphous. Um, in a classic article from the 1970s, Robert Emerson and Sheldon Messenger, um, this is a paper called The Micropolitics of Trouble, um, described uh, the way in which social problems are brought into focus and they suggest that this process of coalescence and consolidation ordinarily must take place before a trouble becomes a more concrete and specific problem uh, for um, social intervention. Mature problems have their origins in, and these are the words of Emerson and Messenger, evanescent, ambiguous difficulties that ultimately may be, but are not immediately identified as deviant. The process by which a problem is brought into focus and consolidated necessarily has both a definitional and a remedial component. The definitional component uh, involves the labels that we assign um, uh, to the problem as it comes into focus. Is it primarily a public health problem? Uh, is it a public safety problem or a problem that falls within some other broad category? The remedial component is the intervention or set of interventions that responsible actors develop to ameliorate or resolve the problem. And the process that Emerson and Messenger described all those years ago is one uh, that is dynamic and cyclical in which the use of the remedy, which follows from a particular definition of a problem, um, then simultaneously serves as a test of that definition. So there's this cycle. We, we conceptualize a problem that brings about certain remedial interventions, and then uh, on the ground, the consequences of applying that remedy uh, serve in a dynamic way uh, to help us redefine our understanding of the problem. This process is recursive and iterative, and is made even more complicated by virtue of the competing positions of the relevant actors. Differing perspectives may lead to highly partisan and hotly contested understandings of what the problem entails and what remedies are called for. The choice, particularly of what Emerson and Messenger called a troubleshooter, uh, the entity, the party or person called upon uh, to provide intervention, is consequential not because it sh just because it shapes the remedial uh, interventions that are likely to take place, which in turn shape the party's understandings of what the problem is, 
but also because it may preemptorily impose a definition on the problem that was previously open or contested. Thus, the decision to seek the assistance of a neighbor or a family member, as opposed to the police, may determine not just what measures are taken, but also what the participants understand the problem to be. Relatedly, the initial choice of a troubleshooter uh, a mental health professional, a social worker, a lawyer, a law enforcement official, a clergy member, or a family member, may work a downstream effect on the evolving understanding of the trouble by impacting whether, where, and how a trouble enters subsequent referral networks. Moreover, when a problem proves resistant to initial remedial measures offered by the first-line troubleshooter, it is likely that the situation will be passed on to more specialized troubleshooters within a given referral network who often deploy more coercive interventions. Now, I, I appreciate your indulgence to let me go through that highly kind of theoretical model. I think it is an important way to think about uh, how we understand the problems that are the focus of a lot of the conversation that's going to take place throughout the day today, I suspect most of that conversation will not be about the micro-politics of uh, troubles, uh, but rather about the macro-politics that help to shape the way in which uh, social responses to social problems take place within a broad uh, social and political contexts. Um, the micro-political negotiations uh, that shape uh, in my world, in the world of problem-solving courts, mental health courts, drug courts, and others, the micro-political negotiations that take place uh, that shape the highly individualistic, medicalized conception of the problems that those courts are addressing um, are characteristic of a broader macro-political um, a, a pattern uh, that represents the sort of neoliberal uh, reforms that are taking place within the criminal legal system and elsewhere uh, and have for the last 35 years. Uh, the daily work of problem-solving courts, judges, lawyers, social workers, case managers, and others takes place within a larger context in which the economic dislocation and systematic marginalization experienced by those caught up in those courts is repackaged as individual problems of irresponsibility. Once repackaged and described in these terms, it's natural that the interventions, the remedies that are offered are behaviorist measures designed to incentivize participation in a mainstream economy. But as one thoughtful writer in this area Kerwin Kay puts it, those who can be re-socialized to respond rationally to the set of rewards and punishments that this neoliberal program has put in place are released from the supervision of the system, while others who are determined to be irrational and thus incapable of regulating their behavior are um, passed into the warehouse prison system. Um, so with that uh, too lengthy uh, set of framing remarks, le let me uh, now turn the podium over to our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Leon. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. I'm really happy to be here today. I was trained in a law school, and I am married to a social worker, so even though I am currently in a sociology department, this feels like home, and this feels like a good interdisciplinary place to have the conversations we're going to have today. So the informal title for my short remarks is this, Foucault in a Trauma-Informed, Gender-Responsive Prison Classroom. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take 60 seconds, and I'm going to time it. I have my phone here ready to go. I would like you to talk to someone sitting next to you or near you, introduce yourself with your first name, and I have a really easy yes-no question for you to answer. So your first name and then answer this question. Can a prison be trauma-informed? <laughs> go. Someone needs to talk to the dean. <laughs> Thank 
came all the way from uh, what? From Israel. Yeah. <laughs> How long was the flight? Uh, twelve hours. That is really outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, your, this is not the first time. No, I did my postdoc here last year. It was okay. for a year in Baltimore. Okay. okay, you need to wrap it up. Away from home. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, wait, can't wait to hear some of your work. Oh. Okay, I need to take back the floor. Which university are you from? <laughs> I'm delighted to hear you talking to each other, and hopefully we'll have lots of opportunities to continue to do so. But now I need to take back the podium for my remaining 14 minutes. So let me just ask for a show of hands. If you answered yes, a trauma can be prison informed. Would you raise your hand? <laughs> wow. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your putting yourself out there. And would you raise your hand if you said no, a prison cannot be trauma informed? Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. So as you heard a little bit in my bio, I'm a Law and Society scholar with a focus on punishment. I do empirical research, I collect data from archives, I interview people, I analyze legislative discourse, and I observe law in action, including in courtrooms and in prisons. And the core question that drives this is what does law do in the world? How does law in action depart from, undermine, or pervert law on the books? what we intended when we created or supported law. How does law express power? How does it concentrate power among elites and concentrate disadvantage on the vulnerable? I rely on a number of sociological approaches to punishment, including Durkheim on symbolic power of law, Marx on who benefits, and Gustafson, an amazing University of Connecticut professor who you should read if you haven't yet, who writes about law as degradation ceremony. Today I'll focus on two others, one more theoretical and one more grounded in local knowledge, both informed by empirical research. So first I'll talk about Foucault on the governmentality of law and how people working within systems shape law in action and put punishment into practice. And I'm happy to share my sources, I'm a teacher, I love to talk about these issues, so I have many things to recommend if any of these pique interest um, in you this morning. I also would encourage you to look out for a forthcoming book in June from Temple University Press called The Compassionate Court, which I have been delighted to work on with professors Corey Stema and Professor Shelley Weikelt. So there's a big picture question that I'm focusing on right now in my research te teaching and activism that I'll share, followed by a brief primer on the two sociological approaches and concluding with an example about how I'm thinking about these issues from within a prison classroom an example of a soft space within a hard place that I think is analogous to many of the uneasy alliances that we're gonna talk about today. So the big question, do we tinker or do we tear it down? That's the big question. It is common among the scholars and activists I know to step back and consider whether we should continue working on incremental improvements in systems that we know cause harm or whether we should remove our energies and work on wholly different responses, including social movements that would secure a broader sense of well-being for all of us and build solidarity across communities. As a professor, I have the luxury of stepping back and asking that question and of choosing to a great degree how I will spend my time, but that doesn't necessarily make the question any easier to contemplate. So today I'm gonna to share a little bit about what goes into my current thinking on these issues, drawing on socio-legal tools. So Foucault asks us to focus on a question similar to what Richard posed this morning. How is the problem described? What is the target of governance? He uses the language of the governmentality of law to focus on the mentality of government. What are we thinking when we choose a particular target, when we narrow our understanding of the problem to a particular set of descriptions? And related to that, what expertise does it call for or shore up? What solutions are therefore called for because of what we've chosen to emphasize in how we explain or locate the problem? What sources of resistance can we anticipate? This approach has helped me understand where to look as I've been trying to understand a variety of social problems, including sexual violence and how we punish people for it, Title IX implementation on college campuses, street-based sex work, and problem-solving courts like mental health courts and prostitution diversion, the last of which I've worked on with Professor Stema and Weichelt. But today I'll apply it to prison education and gender responsive incarceration. But before I do that, I want to describe the other tool in my socio-legal toolkit, 
And that focuses on law in action and the well-meaning professionals who work within oppressive systems. A great deal of writing within law and society literature in the last 50 years and beyond, including the Emerson um, and Meisner piece that Richard shared with us, has examined how people who work within these systems that are often arms of the state, such as schools, police departments, welfare offices, legal aid offices, and others, shape what law means for their clients and for broader social movements. Some of my own recent work has focused on how people work with highly stigmatized and vulnerable populations, which in my research have included family members of convicted sex offenders, street-based sex workers, and people incarcerated in a women's correctional facility who are serving significant sentences. Unlike me, who as a professor has a great deal of choice and autonomy, most of the people who work within these systems, with these populations, serve professional roles that limit in many ways their choices about how to construct the problems they face. This professional influence means that they often have to focus on individual responses, often responsibilizing responses, or what the neoliberal system points us towards in terms of locating problems within individuals rather than in structures or policies. However, our empirical research has shown that they are well aware of the structural forces that dominate the lives of vulnerable populations, including street-based sex workers and women who've been convicted of violence in response to violent relationships, and that is too many of the people I teach in the correctional facility where I work. They are people who have acted in violence in response to interpersonal and patriarchal violence. So how do these well-meaning people who work in these systems address their work? In one strand of research, Professor Stema and I have found that they target their sympathy to a relatively narrow category of people who meet their criteria of worthiness, which ends up diverting resources towards this favored group, as well as reinforcing ideas about who deserves assistance and support and who doesn't. A much larger body of research documents how these kinds of uses of professional discretion can soften hard systems, as well as shape how regular people believe the law is available to them what we call legal consciousness. Such professionals act as agents of transformation. For example, hearing someone's complaint about a harm they've experienced and reframing it for them, either as a violation of rights or as a common experience that just has to be dealt with and set aside. In the setting I'm thinking about most right now, a women's correctional facility, I've interacted with correctional officers, teachers, and counselors who have exhibited great sensitivity towards the needs of the people incarcerated there, recognizing them as excellent mothers, exemplary artists, poets, and brilliant students. I have also observed some of these workers engage in the kinds of humiliating and degrading behaviors towards incarcerated people that reinforce boundaries between good and bad, worthy and unworthy, acceptably feminine and manipulative, problematic, or otherwise unruly women. So I've seen the power of professionals' care, as well as observed and experienced secondhand the harms that working within these oppressive systems creates, even for the most caring and careful of professionals. Which leads me to the current quandary. So let me set the stage. For about eight years, um, except for a couple semesters during the pandemic, I have spent nearly every fall and spring semester teaching a college course within a women's correctional facility. It's an inside-out course, meaning half are incarcerated students and half traditional college students who come with me into the facility and each week for class. In order to be allowed in, students who are not incarcerated have to fill out paperwork, disclosing their own criminal histories or their contact with incarcerated loved ones, and attend a security briefing. This year, the security briefing took place within the visiting room of the correctional facility, a space that in all my time there I had never been in before. We sat in small chairs, kind of like those in an elementary school, with bright paintings of butterflies and flowers on the wall, children's toys and books jumbled on the shelving around us. The correctional officer leading the briefing read from the same PowerPoint I've heard over a dozen times now. The bulk of the briefing was CYA type material, covering the policies so should any problems occur, the institution could say they had informed and done their best. And this included a ceremonial signing of the Prison Rape Elimination Act Statement of Responsibility. There was a striking paradox within the content as well. On the one hand, the facility introduces itself in its mission statement as gender responsive and trauma informed. We were seated in a room that underscored the reality that many incarcerated women and femme people are caregivers, often of young children and of others who may be able to visit them, although most people are not able to visit their loved ones as often as they would like, if at all. 
On the other hand, many slides of the security briefing were devoted to preparing visitors to the facility to guard against the manipulation we were told is an essential characteristic of incarcerated women. Over and over, the correctional officer, herself a woman, told us to avoid allowing situations to occur in which the manipulative women could take advantage of us because women are catty and women are devious. At a women's facility, the danger was not constructed as a physical threat or even the risk of a riot or other kind of prison uprising, but rather of a more subtle vulnerability to coercion that incarcerated women had mastered, according to this narrative. Ironically, in other work, Professor Steman and I have written about what we see as the selective manipulation of criminalized women, the street savvy and often quite sophisticated ability to persevere in situations that many of us in this room could not expect to handle with nearly the aplomb that these women do. But within the correctional context, after having been convicted and sentenced for behavior related to what may have been survival decisions, this skill set is now constructed as problematic and indicative of an essential deviance. For my outside students and the other visitors trying to take in this messaging, how are we to reconcile the desire to be trauma-informed and gender responsive with the command that we stay on our guard and choose not to believe women or their stories of what is important to them and what they need? This in turn leads me to question teaching a course within the correctional system that offers college credits to the incarcerated women, a space to explore ideas and interact with people who don't live on the same cell block, and to develop skills that may be helpful in writing parole statements or in future life settings. All of these are good things, but is this tinkering? By providing a rehabilitative program at no cost to the correctional facility that the facility can then use to tout its rehabilitation and gender responsiveness, does this kind of effort perpetuate an essentially violent system? Does it confirm ideas of deservingness and undeservingness? Is it a reformist reform or a non-reformist reform? The more I spend time in this prison, the more I appreciate all of the people there, including the incarcerated people and those who work there. But I also feel increasingly uncomfortable with the legitimation that my presence may serve. Yet I have students, both incarcerated and not incarcerated, who have chosen social justice-oriented career paths as a result of these kinds of courses, and whose lives are incrementally better as a result. So this is where I leave you, with my uneasiness, with my alliance with a system I cannot condone. As we consider other examples today of soft spaces within hard systems, especially those that provide mental health assessment or treatment to people made marginal through social structures and criminal legal systems, where do we intervene? Do we choose to make more humane what we can, while also working from without these systems to dismantle them? And is it really possible to do both of those things? I look forward to listening and learning as our day goes forward. Thank you. Do uh, Dr. Sinclair. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Haiku. And if you're from a small town up north, from my neighborhood in Brooklyn, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, before I begin, I want to take one indulgence. I want to first say this is Women's History Month, and I want everyone to sort of look around at all these women in, in this room and give all these women a good round of applause. <laughs> That's very important to me. Secondly, I want to say this is also Social Work History Month, and as a proud social worker, I want to give all the social workers in the room a round of applause. I want to thank Professor Corey. I want to thank Professor Richard for allowing me to take the stage and talk about a little bit about what I know. But before I begin, uh, again, 
I'm very rooted in my Afrocentricity. And it's important for me to get permission for those who I consider my elders to give me permission to speak in front of this august audience. So if someone who believes that they're older than me, and I'm not going to ask anybody for their age, if they could just say, go ahead, amen, or, or just even raise their hand, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll have permission to speak. I think it's important because I represent the Morgan State University, a historically black college that's rooted in Afrocentric history. When I came up here and when I was offered an opportunity to talk in front of this audience, I, I, I grappled with the title, Uneasy Alignment. And I paused and I said, well, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a lawyer, nor am I mentally ill, so what gives me permission to talk about this? Well, in fact, I would describe myself in, in very multiple facets, but one of the most important is that I'm a father. I'm a father of a 16-year-old son who struggles with mental illness. So I understand experientially and epistemologically what mental illness can do to a family. Now I see, just going around the room, everybody clapped early on about women's history, so I know your hands work. Please raise your hand if you know somebody who's suffering or living with a mental illness. It's important for everyone to look around the room to know how many people are living with or know somebody who's living with. In fact, some research has said one in every 10 people have had a psychotic episode in their life. I want that to sit with you for a little while because as a mental health professional, an advocate, an advocate, and an educator, I think it's important for you to put a face to those people who are living with mental illness. You see, when we talk about the legal system and mental illness, we're talking about two divergent systems that very often don't talk to one another. They have a different understanding, a different perspective on the world. And I wanna see if I could bridge the gap in the few minutes I have up here. First of all, I think that in understanding mental illness, we need to understand that mental illness is a broad set of categories of symptoms, but more than that, we're talking about people. Social work is not something that we do to someone, it's something that we do with someone. So we have to put a personal touch into the lives that we work with. So with that being said, in order to properly frame the issues, I'll tell you a little bit about my background and how I came into working with those people living, living with mental illness. And I, and I use that word very carefully. Um, I don't call them mentally ill because that depersonalizes that. They're much more than their illness and their symptomology. They're a person who's living with. I'm a diabetic. I don't go around saying, hey, my name is Michael, I'm a diabetic. I am much more than that. I have multiple facets, as I mentioned earlier. So my background starts in a small neighborhood up north that some of you may have heard of. It's called Brooklyn, New York. Have, have you ever heard of that little city? I came out of high school and I started to go to college as a way of learning about the world and learning about myself. I entered into a um, family service association working with young people that were young fathers. And one of the things that I realized in working with young fathers, these were young men, 16 to 21, that um, were disconnected from their progeny, from their children. And after speaking with them for about two or three years, I realized that there was something there was a, a pattern that I was noticing. 
Many of them had a checkered past with the legal system. They've been in and out of jail, which prompted me to write my first grant for a post-institutional program in Brooklyn, New York. And I worked with young people coming out of incarceration. Many of the young people that I worked with were drug dealers when drug, drug dealing was quote unquote popular back in the crack epidemic in, in Brooklyn, New York. But I also worked with gang members. And I worked with the serious and most violent offenders in the community. One of them, one young person that I worked with, I'm going to call him Victor for the state of this conversation, was a young man who really didn't have a lot of trouble with the law, but he was on probation at the time that I met with him. He, start, he started selling drugs, but he had a full-time job at the time, but he used his, his drug money to augment his salary. Many of our young people at that time, and, and still to this day, have a moral conundrum in terms of, you know, his issue was, you want me to support my children, but I don't have the means and resources to do so. So he started to what we call hustle on the side. He got arrested and he went to jail. When he went to jail, he left his three little children with his um, then fiance. When he got arrested, he was roughed up by the police officers in East New York. And as a result, he lost his hearing. He went into the hospital for three days. He came out and he served his time at Rikers. I continued to work with him until he was released. Um, it's important to know that he was traumatized by that experience. But it's also important to know that he went to Rikers. Some of you may not be able to conceptualize Rikers Island but it's a prison in New York City that has 40,000 inmates. It is the largest provider of mental health services in New York City and in the country. One third of that prison budget is due to psychotropic medication. Does everybody get that? So as he was released back into the community, now he was on parole, he ended up um, losing the job that he, he first had. He ended up not being able to provide for his children. The whole experience of being locked up was dehumanizing and very humiliating for Victor. I got a call one evening from Victor's fiance asking me to come by the house. She thought something was wrong. She said Victor hasn't been talking to her. He's been withdrawn. He's been um, irritable. And she thought that he needed some help. I walked into the apartment in the pink houses in Brooklyn only to find Victor's deceased body. He had committed suicide. He left 35 cents, all the money that he had to help with his children. Feeling that he lost his job and his ability to provide as a key role in that family, Victor took his life. Victor was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and perhaps undiagnosed depression. This is how it happens to real people. But let's talk about that and let's explore that a little bit more. People living with mental illnesses are four times as likely to be arrested at least one time in their life than those people who are not living with mental illness. In fact, they're 10 times as likely to have multiple arrests in their life, according to Sellers in 2015. One of the things that we need to know about mental illness is that people living with, mentally, with mental illness are often more vulnerable and more likely to be a victim, actually 11 times more likely to be a victim 
of a violent crime than them to be the aggressor. As a trained professional clinician, only a small fraction of mental illnesses lead to aggressive behaviors. More than likely, those people who are suffering from mental illness, you are more of a threat to them than they are to you, despite what the media says. So in talking about that and reframing that, we have to hold the media accountable for creating the stigma around mental illness. People living with mental illnesses want the same things that we want. They want peace. They want to live in secure communities. They want to, they want to be able to sleep at night. They want the same things that we want. Now, in learning a little bit more about mental illnesses, mental illness is not an excuse or a predictor of violence. Just because you have a mental illness, that doesn't mean that you will naturally be violent. So how does mental illness intersect with the legal system? Well, our Constitution has some certain constraints on the power of government to intervene in the lives of people and individuals who are living with mental disturbances. It is the intersection of crime that really makes the issue profound and really exacerbates the issue. Mental illnesses that change the balance that government gives an opportunity for us to intervene. Now sometimes what we realize is that we don't do a really good job in providing the services necessary to those people who are living with mental illness. And it really goes back actually about 70 years in this society. What we have done in this society is we have um, deinstitutionalized these mental illness or mental health asylums, and we released them back into the community without any sustainable care. And as a result, we have an increase in homelessness, but we have also began to criminalize mental illness. I'm not sure if some of you remember, but maybe I'm dating myself. It was Rosemary Kennedy that was a sister of John F. Kennedy, who was institutionalized and eventually had a lobotomy. And John F. Kennedy said, you know, enough is enough. We need to deinstitutionalize. And some of you may have been old enough, and I'm not going to date myself, to remember One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or Ken Kesey's book. When we started allowing people to come out of these insane asylums, we let them out without any um, sustainable long-term care. And which is worse, as a society, we've criminalized mentally ill. In fact, in fact, according to NAMI, that when we have criminalized mental illness, I want you to walk through the steps, and I, I think um, you alluded to it. When you are arrested for a crime, you are removed from the community, and we're going to talk about the police in a second. Um, you're removed from the community, you're put into a jail, and oftentimes you are assessed and you may be even given a pretrial assessment by a psychiatrist or a, actually a psychologist or a mental health professional. That's perhaps the worst time to assess somebody for mental illness. At that time, being removed from my community, being removed from my family, being removed from my friends and all that I know, this is not, I'm not having a good day. And if you're going to ask me, so how are things going? You're going to get the response that many um, offenders or alleged offenders give. Fine, leave me alone. I don't need anything. They're often put into a jail cell for observation for several days, which is very, very 
um, dehumanizing. In fact, it's disorienting. They don't know day from night or night from day. They are there with no communication with anyone. Now, the prisons say that that's for their own best interest because they need to be um, processed before they are put into general population. When they're put into general population, you'll have people who have undiagnosed trauma, undiagnosed a variety of mental illnesses with very little intervention. Now, the question that was asked earlier, and I'm going to actually bring this up again, can a prison be a adequate mental health facility? No. Oh. They're two separate things with two separate purposes. Nor should a mental health facility imprison people. There are two separate divergent issues here, but we seem to use them synonymously and interchangeably. Prisons should not be the place where many urban poor get their first level of treatment for serious and very complicated problems that are, have an interdynamic with the family. Uh, let me just back up one second and I, and I emphasize family. When a person is suffering or when a person is living with mental illness, it's not their problem. It's the family's problem. And families need to be a part of the intervention strategies. In social work, we use Broffenbrenner's, the person in the environment, or the ecosystem approach. We have to take a look at the environment as well as the individual. When I first went to Columbia University School of Social Work, I was overzealous about that idea because I often noted to my family and my friends, you can't take a look at the seed without taking a look at the soil which surrounds it. So if we're not going to address the issue of mental illness in our society, then putting them in prison is not an acceptable resolution or a remedy for those people who want to live a life. Now, again, Talcott Parsons, a sociologist, will say there's a functionalist perspective, and there's a reason that we do these things, and there's money. But let me just talk about the money. Because when we put a person in prison, we are spending, as taxpayers, about 102 to $110 a day for a person that is incarcerated, which is about thirty-seven dollars to $38,000 a year to incarcerate a person. Everybody get that? We're losing money when we could have spent that money to really provide adequate mental health treatment. If a person, if we reallocate that money, 35 days in a prison, the cost that we would spend would properly take care of people living with mental illnesses with a variety of uh, mental illnesses, such as depression, bipolar, um, you know, anxiety. Those are oftentimes affordable if we take a look at 35 days in prison and the cost that we're spending. We could spend it to help people while they're out. But it does more. When you put a person in prison, and I'm just going to say, if you are putting a child in prison, you're spending almost $588 a day in putting a child in prison. $214,000 a year to incarcerate a child whose brain is still developing. I have a 16-year-old at home, and I'll, I'll be the first one to tell him that I don't blame you for making mistakes and not cleaning your room because your brain is still developing, and that's why you have parents. <laughs> uh, I said your amygdala makes you prone 
to making poor decisions. So that's why you have parents. Um, but really, when we start taking a look at and exploring the problem, if we provide adequate mental health care to those people who are living with mental illness prior to them going to prison, you would really reduce the amount of people that are going to prison to encounter their first mental health treatment. But it also, for those people who are being released, it really reduces recidivism. If they could manage their problems, and, and I, want you, I want you to understand the comorbidity between mental illness and substance abuse. If we could deal with the root causes of these problems, it will reduce the recidivism rate. And when we reduce the recidivism rate, we make stronger families. Because those people who are breadwinners come back to their families, and they want to contribute to their families and their communities. It makes safer communities when we have stronger families. It makes sense. Those people that are incarcerated each year as a country, we lose $193 billion of gross national pro um, 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 product. We lose that money and lose that labor potential because people are incarcerated. Now, um, when I was younger, and I, I think I mentioned that um, I grew up in a large family in New York. My younger brother is an attorney, so we have really good conversations. My, my older brother is a retired state trooper. So we really make some very rich conversations around the Thanksgiving Day table. Because we all take a look at the issue of crime and mental illness very differently. Now, it doesn't make sense for people to sort of say, well, if you are a, a mental health clinician, then you see all problems through the same prism that everybody has a mental health problem. Well, that's not true. I don't believe that everybody has a mental health problem. But I do believe that, I do believe that, um, that we all know somebody who do, and we could do something about that. You know, when we talk about the legal system, we're talking about not only police officers, we're talking about lawyers, we're talking about judges, who really have a misunderstanding of what mental illness is. And it really doesn't strike home for them until they're directly affected. When somebody in their family comes home and has a psychotic break, then they realize that it's a human experience. And we're all vulnerable to that. So one of the things that I would like to offer here today is that when we start taking a look at mental illnesses, it's a pervasive problem. 73% of all women in prison have a DSM-5 diagnosed mental illness, 73%. 55% of all men in prison have a DSM diagnosis. 40% of all inmates, inmates have two or more DSM diagnoses. So we're in an issue where we cannot solve our mental health issues by just criminalizing mental illness. We cannot put people in jail and hope for them to be better. Jail is not a substitute for proper mental health care. Um, I'm going to close in saying that we have a tremendous opportunity here to really make some changes about how we view mental illness. But we need to start educating and we need to start having cross communications between the legal system and all its entities. We're talking about police officers who get trained. Only 88 police officers in Baltimore City have crisis intervention training. 
you know, it's, it's a small portion, a small fraction. We don't have proper training for police officers, and we don't have proper training for judges. We need to have conversations about making mental health a human issue and not just a criminal issue. And with that being said, police are not always the culprit, but they are the first interface that many people who are ex exhibiting some psychotic symptoms, they need to know what to do. And without giving them the proper tools, you're really setting them up as well as putting people, lives at stake. I would be remiss if I didn't say as an African American, it has a disproportionate effect on my community. My community um, hesitates, particularly African American males, to seek mental health treatment. My community is more likely to interface with the legal system. My community is at stake. So I would hope that this conversation continues be beyond this forum today and see how we could have more people, attorneys, lawyers, judges, police officers, correctional officers, be abreast of what it feels like or what it looks like to live with a mental illness. Ladies and gentlemen, have a good day. Good morning. Boker Tov. It's in Hebrew. <laughs> um, I suggest we start with um, getting to know each other. I think that we'll find many things that are in common. My name is Inbar. I'm a social worker, and my PhD is in criminology. My main research focus is the interchange between behavioral science and the law. I guess this interchange also exists here in this audience, considering the fact that the conference is a joint initiative of the law school and the social work school. Another thing we have in common, I think, is the fact that most of the people here today recognize that there is a problem in the social services system, be it welfare or legal systems. It feels like what started out as a good idea, an admirable effort on the state's part to help people, ends up sometimes hurting them. So today I want to offer my take on the matter based on the research that I've conducted in Israel and here at UMB last year with Professor Koresh Dema. I think the meeting of social work and the law is not a chance encounter. Professor Isi Doron from the social school, from the social work school at the University of Haifa in Israel claims that social work and the law can be perceived as two monikers of the same social tool, a tool that serves the same purpose, guarding human rights, helping marginalized communities, and promoting social change. On the other hand, through the provision of social services, be it welfare or legal systems services, both professions hold, hold a great deal of power and authority over individuals. Social workers can remove children from their homes based on what they perceive as maintaining their safety and taking care of their well-being. In Israel, social workers can recommend keeping people in detention before or during trial, or not granting them early release from prison based on rehabilitative reasons. When the court accepts the social workers' recommendations, they gain legal status. On the other hand, the law as a legal structure represents the public interest. We have to ask ourselves, who's that public? Are people from marginalized communities part of this public? Is the law designed to help them? Does it represent their interests? Who writes the law? 
So is the interchange between social work and the law a joint venture for social change? Or are they both tools of power? I want to offer my observation on the interchange between social work and the law and my take on this question. It may be used as a lens while listening to the following interesting presentations we have today. So many, many years ago, I worked at the Sexual Assault Crisis Center in Tel Aviv as the head of the Witness Assistance Program. Part of my role was to facilitate courses for prosecutors and judges regarding the emotional repercussions of sexual assault. My role made me realize how important mental health knowledge was for legal practitioners. Not just to determine the appropriate rehabilitative venue, but also to determine victims' credibility, for example, which is highly relevant for the verdict. In my PhD, I studied this topic further and examined the way mental health knowledge is implemented in sexual assault proceedings in Israel. I found that in some cases, its implementation led to the shifting of the needle in what constitutes due process. So therapeutic considerations were more important than legal ones. I coined it as the theory legal discretion. My dissertation was based on therapeutic jurisprudence, commonly referred to as TJ, which is a legal theory developed by Professor David Wexler and the late Professor Bruce Winnick. TJ perceives the law, legal actors, and legal settings as therapeutic agents, essentially adding an additional purpose or goal for legal systems. In addition to representing the public interest, retribution, guiding behaviors, and guarding victims' rights, the law, its rules, procedure, and legal practitioner's behavior should strive to have therapeutic consequences and avo avoid anti-therapeutic consequences, as long as this aim does not infringe on due process. What I found out in my research was that the implementation of mental health knowledge in legal proceedings radically changed the legal construct and the due process in some cases. In this case, I saw not just TJ, but what I coined as radical TJ. For example, vital evidence such as therapeutic records that could add to the victim's credibility in court were not submitted so as not to invade the victim's privacy and damage the therapeutic process. This is a classic case of therapeutic consideration trumping legal ones. This is radical TJ, a profound change to due process to accommodate therapeutic considerations and consequences. TJ was developed by legal professionals and academics as a response of their disenchantment with the US legal system, where nothing seemed to work. Punishment and incarceration didn't reduce crime or recidivism, a reality of mass incarceration and collateral consequences, which became a target for criticism, including vast racial disparities. Some perceived these, these as human rights violation, some as an unnecessary waste of the taxpayer's money. Legal practitioners, as well as politicians, felt the need to come up with a different way to tackle crime. On one of the proposal aligned with TJ was again a noble attempt to approach problems that lead to offending from their root. We know that most of the offenders come from marginalized communities. Most of them live in poverty, many suffer from mental illness or addiction, some don't have education or vocation, vocational training to secure living wage employment. The idea was to enroll them in a rehabilitative program that helps them deal with their addiction, mental health problems, or past traumas, and to receive vocational training, education, and employment support, and then 
they will not resort to criminal behavior. Sounds great, right? A perfect interchange between social work and the law. This thought led to the establishment of the problem-solving courts. Problem-solving courts are based on teamwork among relevant legal and social actors, such as prosecutors, defense attorneys, social workers, and relevant members of the community. The team develops a treatment program designed to address the underlying circumstances leading to the criminal behavior and monitor its fulfillment while trying to motivate the defendant to complete the process. Since the first problem-solving court established in 1989 in Miami, thousands of problem-solving courts have been established across the U.S. and include drug courts, veteran courts, domestic violence court, mental health courts, and prostitution courts, and so on. This led to a global phenomenon. Problem-solving courts were established all over the world and the problem-solving court movement was created. There are problem-solving courts in Australia, New Zealand, England, even in tiny Israel. We have 10 problem-solving courts, and eight more are about to be open. I know it doesn't sound much, but we're a small country. We're only 9 million people, only have six state districts, so trust me, it's a lot. The problem-solving courts are the epitome of TJ. They are designed not only to avoid anti-therapeutic consequences, but to encourage therapeutic ones. This is the law not just as an, a therapeutic agent. This is the law as a therapist. So for me, a social worker and a criminologist, it is a treat to examine this phenomenon through a radical TJ eyes. So to see if problem-solving courts offer radical solutions and this is where macro social work came in hand when I studied the prostitution diversion program in Philadelphia with Professor Corey Steyma of the School of Social Work here at UMB last year. As a disclaimer, not all problem-solving courts tailor rehabilitation, rehabilitative plans for their participants. Some focus on surveillance or only on the provision of welfare benefits. Even those which try to tailor rehabilitative plan and may, may even succeed in helping people stop offending, escape poverty, and enhance their well-being, even then, when we look at the greater scheme of things, we cannot say that problem-solving courts offer anything new under the sun. In Israel, for example, there was a decrease in the crime rate in recent years, but it was not due to problem-solving courts. It was due to early release initiative and decriminalization of various offenses. During COVID, we could, track, we could also track a decrease in the crime rate, which was evident in other countries, though it did not include domestic violence offenses, which were unfortunately on the rise. So why is that? Why does tackling the problem from its root does not help? Well, because maybe this is not the actual root. I always thought that social work had a lot to contribute to legal thinking, and I think that is, that is especially true in this case, particularly macro social work, which aligns perfectly with radical TJ. When we studied uh, the Philadelphia's prostitution court, which is called Dawn Court, we found that all of the participants were offered, actually mandated, sexual trauma treatment under the assumption that all of them were sexually assaulted, often as, as children, and that the sexual assault contributed to sex work. Another treatment that most of them were required to attend was for substance abuse. Along with those two therapeutic interventions, participants were offered help with receiving social services and benefits. When we interviewed participants, as well as legal and therapeutic staff, we found that they were critical of the rehabilitative programming offered by Don Court, but that wasn't all. They were also critical of the lack of social solutions. 
macro solutions that they wanted, macro solutions that they wanted to see included were reallocating funds from law enforcement to the establishment of lacking social services, such as vocational training and housing. They also offered legislative initiatives, like decriminalizing prostitution or shifting the criminalization to clients. Their criticism is one that we are very familiar in macro social work. Social problems should receive social solutions. And offering micro interventions may well solve this or that individual's problems, but on a greater scale, it will be no more than a band-aid fix. It may even deflect attention from the social problem or risk blaming individuals for their failure to rescue themselves from larger social forces. The social problem will remain. So is it radical, TJ? We would have to answer no to this question. What was interesting for us was that none of the research respondents thought that the social solutions they offered was the court's responsibility. What would need to happen to make Don Court a form of radical TJ? If the court would use its social capital, its connections to social services and public officials to promote social change, that would make it radical because such moves would essentially come at its own expense. The court promoting a reality where the selling of sex is not a crime and using its, using its fundings to broaden social services, that would be radical. Having the court collaborate with other social systems, such as welfare systems, until there was no longer any need for the court itself, this would be radical therapeutic jurisprudence as suggested by the application of macro social work practice and values. So for today, when listening to all the wonderful presentations that await us, try to listen through radical or even radical TJ ears as filtered through the lens of macro social work. And we, me and you, will meet again at the end of the day and exchange free radical thoughts. <laughs> Have fun. Okay, um, uh, we have about 15 minutes. Um, uh, there um, have been a lot of um, provocative uh, ideas uh, thrown out. Let me, let me see if they've um, uh, stimulated any thoughts or questions uh, from anyone. Uh, let's have a conversation. Anyone? You're going to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very deep question, and actually, 
I just got a SAMHSA grant to, to deal with teen suicide. That's a very important because the number one cause of death in prison is suicide. Oh, sorry about that. The number one leading cause of deaths in prison is suicide. Um, we do need to destigmatize suicide, but there's a larger issue at hand. The larger issue is um, suicide is often seen as a, not only an individual act, but it's an act of weakness, and it's actually people that are struggling. Um, as a psychologist, you know that they may be struggling from years, and suicide seems to be an option when all other resources have been exhausted. Um, with that being said, we need to have more um, community education around suicide and suicide prevention. And when I'm dealing with the suicide prevention and, and the grant that I'm, I just got issued from um, SAMHSA is really dealing around um, creating a culture around school systems, understanding the symptoms that sort of precede suicide. It, so we need to change the language. You know, committing suicide, died by suicide, is really, uh, it's really a critical point, but it really is minor compared to the fact that we need to destigmatize mental illness as a whole. And that takes much more than the conversations, but it really takes bringing a face to mental illness. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and saying, you know, I don't have my super Superman glasses, but we have people in this room that are living with mental illnesses right now that are highly functional, highly capable. So suicide shouldn't be considered a weakness, and it shouldn't be considered something that's a a character flaw. It's it's a really just one of the symptoms of like major depression or, or bipolar depression. So I, I hope I answered your question. Other thoughts, other questions? Yes. Hi, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so I guess my question, just based on the discussion of all three panelists, honestly, is sort of, the arguments that each one of you guys were making were sort of in line with the movement to abolish prisons. Um, so I guess I just want to know more your thoughts on that movement, just considering the stats that we talked about today, that over half of both prison populations of both men and women are dealing with a mental health um, disease. And also on the fact from the last question that we have these issues of suicide, not just among the prisoners, but also the correctional officers. And I guess, is there, or do you guys see a legitimate purpose for prisons in our society? And are they impacting sort of our progress on dealing with mental health issues? I'm glad you asked that, right? Because it's it's pretty clearly what's called for. So for me, it's simple. Yes, we should abolish prisons. In a civilized society, we should have no need for prisons if we're dealing with the mental illness as we should. In a civilized society, um, the stigma that we put on prisoners is they are they have what we consider the scarlet letter you know they leave prison and they may have done their time i just want you to understand again when we start talking about um how people with mental illnesses interface with police officers 34 percent of people with um the interaction between police and people with living with mental illnesses are for nonviolent offenses it's for um, sometimes being a public nuisance or public urination. So 34% of that really doesn't need to be arrested. And those sometimes people who are arrested are arrested for petty crimes like, like shoplifting, you know. Now, for you to be in prison for shoplifting, it's an indictment on our society. The need for shoplifting, why are you shoplifting? If you're shoplifting because you need food, that's not an individual flaw. That's a society 
error. So we need to start taking a broader picture. Um, one of the things that we talk about in the School of Social Work at Morgan State University is we have to stop blaming the victim. We have to stop blaming the victim. And sometimes those victims are those people living with mental illnesses that are unfortunately swept up because we don't have a good place in our society for those people who are struggling with some internal issues. Oh, you got the all mic. I think we have to ask ourselves what are prisons for and who's convicted? And we see that most of the people that are convicted are people that live in poverty, people that have mental health issues, and also people from marginalized communities, people of color. And this is what we're criminalizing, mental health, poverty, and people of color. So this, is, this goes, as a social worker, it goes against every fiber of our profession, every ethics of our profession. This is the opposite of solidarity. This is not a solidary uh, solution. This is a solution that wants to um, align with neoliberal um, considerations. And we have to a apply a macro social work lens in order to, to fight that. So we can think fundamentally, how can we offer solutions to poverty, to mental health, to discrimination? And this would never be prison. I, I, I just want to throw my two cents in for, for a moment here to, to make this a bit more complex. So uh, Dr. Sinclair talked about the um, the, the dynamic of um, uh, criminalizing mental illness, and uh, I, th I think we need to appreciate how serious that is. Um, but to go back to the uh, remarks that I began with about this sort of dynamic, um, complicated way in which we conceptualize problems, there's also a, um, a f f fair amount of information uh, that suggests that we, that we also medicalize other characteristics, um, uh, so the, the statistics about the number of people with DSM diagnoses who are incarcerated, for example, is a complex description. Um, there's, I'm, I'm looking at um, some very good uh, ethnographic work that was done years ago on an adult, psych, uh, I'm sorry, an adolescent uh, psychiatric hospital where the researcher reported that Therapists and other staff members frequently recognized that there was nothing wrong with many of the juveniles in their care beyond the fact they had no place to go. Uh, but these institutional agents nevertheless routinely assigned a DSM diagnosis on admission because failure to designate a mental health problem or a problem in medical terms meant that public or private insurance wouldn't be available to fund their stay. And once the problem is presented, uh, presented by residents is medicalized in that way, routine interactions between staff and patients get redefined in terms of that labeling um, so that clients become good patients or bad patients depending upon how open they are to those therapeutic interventions. So, the challenges that face us as lawyers and social workers and human services workers concerned about these issues are, more, are even more difficult because it's a kind of double-edged sword. Um, it is the case that, that uh, behavioral health and mental illness is, um, is uh, undertreated, that there are inadequate community-based resources for people who are struggling. Uh, with uh, chronic mental illness and often severe chronic mental illness. But it is also the case that these institutions, these neoliberal institutions that individualize and medicalize the problems that people are struggling with that are the result of racism, um, 
of, uh, of uh, decompensating communities, um, of economic dislocation, uh, uh, that those are also uh, deeply intertwined in the way we understand what the problem is. Okay. Yeah. Can, can I just, I just want to make, yeah. I'm always, I'm always on educator mode. In the break that we have, I want everyone to take out their cell phone and look at this term called drapetomania. I'm going to try to spell it for you. D-R-A-P-E-T-O-M-I-M-A-N-I-A. Drapetomania. And I bring this up to touch on, uh, on Professor Bolt's um, topic. We as mental health professionals have some ascribed power, and we have to take a look at the insidious nature of power. We have the ability to change people's lives as clinicians. If I put in someone's chart that you have schizophrenia, you'll never be able to be a pilot or probably carry a firearm in certain states. We have a lot of power. We have to use that power judiciously, and, and, and we have to start taking a look at the fuller picture. Sometimes behaviors are often over-pathologized. And during the 80s, we had a, a period of where every child needed Ritalin. You know, that was just a magic drug, you know. Again, we have a lot of power, and we need to be able to provide the resources and use our, as I believe, you said our, our, our political gravitas to make sure that there are agencies in the community that allow people to get the proper services so that they don't have to be in one system or the other, but they, they can live in the community, feel safe, and, and reach their optimum goals. I'm sorry about that. One last question or thought. Uh, my career has been in forensic hospitals, doing forensic discharge planning, and I found my way working with women's reentry now in DC. And my question is for anybody on the panel. We talk about you know how prisons are obviously inappropriately used as mental health hospitals, and the reasons why people end up um, in prison are complex. But I guess what my question is something I grapple with working with clients is that although I may understand that their trauma, poverty, racial issues have led them to making decisions that led them in, into prison, I've also worked with clients who have committed heinous crimes. So regardless of the reason, is I guess what I'm saying is where's the line between public safety and addressing mental illness. So of course, and I'm not suggesting that everyone with a mental illness commits heinous crimes. I'm saying that I've had clients who have, and it's like, as the social worker part of me, it's like, of course I wanna advocate for you and make sure you get the mental health services that you need, but I also realize that you have done very violent things or have been, or, or, or are dangerous when in a community. So I guess the, the main question is, if we abolish prisons, where do the people go who hurt other people and need to be some some place, regardless of their mental health? So I grapple with that as well. So the, the women in the courses I teach are all serving very long sentences because people have died by violence at their hands. So I, I hear what you're what you're saying, and so I I don't want to be I don't want it to be perceived that I was being glib when I answered your question and saying yes we should abolish prisons. I, that is what I believe, but I also recognize it's a it's an incremental process that's going to take us a while to get there. And what I meant in the simplicity of my answer is you know addressing what, how we're thinking about what the problem is and thinking about what the solution is, and we have too narrowly focused on these criminal justice and correctional approaches. So I'm not saying, you know, burn it all down today, but I do think our long-term goal should be that's what we're working towards, and we're working towards the community base, the community empowering, all of the other elements that we're, we're talking about today. In my, in my early career, I worked with people who would kill you as quick as they would drink a Sprite. It was nothing. Um, but they are much more than their actions. 
I, I want you to understand that as a social worker, I think it's important to understand that we are not God. We are not a higher being. People do make mistakes. And people may need to think about their mistakes. But at the time, I want you to also understand that people can change. I know some young people who have done some very, very serious and, and violent crimes and even has committed murder. But when they did that at 18, who they are at 43 is no longer that same person. And I would, I would venture to say many of you are not the same person that you were when you were 17 or 18 years old. So the reason why we have psychologists and we have um, psychiatrists and counselors and social workers is because we do believe that people have the capacity to change and become more than their immediate actions. So yes, I've worked with people who committed very, very violent crimes. Some of them may show remorse and some of them may take a longer time to show remorse. But I can say it does impact them. You cannot kill somebody and not feel a sense of, um, of that you have done something final. So I believe that although there are people that need to be incarcerated, but we have to find some way of understanding that 95% of the people that are incarcerated will eventually return back to communities. And what do we do then? What do we do after we warehouse a person for 20 years and not rehabilitate them, but just warehouse them? They're going to come back to the community with a scarlet letter and more stigmatized, not only for their mental illness, but not have any family supports. We have taken away the one thing that keeps people human, contact with other humans. <laughs> so to answer your question, I, I believe that, that we have to rethink this whole purpose of prison and how we are going to use prison as an opportunity to help people reassimilate back into the community, which is almost an eventuality. Inbar, you get the last word. Oh, yay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. Perfect. I've traveled enough to earn this right. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be here. I think that the main reason in this neoliberal era the main thing, I think, the main phenomenon is that we automatically um, deal with social problems through law. This is our go-to solution. Now let's, for example, uh, think about um, Portugal. Um, drug use is not criminalized in Portugal. Now yay, let's all go to Portugal. No, it's not for that. It is tackled, but through therapeutic solutions, through social solutions, through economic solutions, we have to think about the reason that causes people, even with mental illness, to commit a crime. Now the reason that one person with a, a mental illness commits a crime and the other one doesn't, may also be connected to the fact that he, was, he had a lot of uh, support growing up. So how do we um, create the support for everyone. This is the radical thought behind uh, the will not to punish people for their vulnerabilities, but actually help them if they want help. So on the one hand, do not criminalize many offenses, many uh, behaviors that are now criminalized. Don't go automatically to criminalizing uh, behaviors. The other one is don't think that every undesirable behavior that you may think is undesirable should be an offense or should be um, <clears throat> reprimanded. Like, for example, drug use. Should we reprimand dr uh, people that use drugs? I don't know. Is, there, is it their own free choice to use drugs? I don't know. We should ask these questions. So I think this is like the lens that I'm looking through when I uh, perceive imprisonment. It's a larger issue of why the law has become such a go-to uh, solution. 
Maybe because the welfare system is weak, the education system is weak, and we have weakened it. So we should strengthen it. And uh, at the sake of, you know, having some people not like me so much here in this audience, weaken the law a bit. <laughs> I, I thank the panelists well, for I a uh, <laughs> terrific beginning to what I know will be a very uh, insightful day. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Or I'll see you. You know, that's our goal too. Can we give another round of applause to our panelists? <laughs>